Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the NOAA Central Library with the Technology Transfer Office um, for our webinar today. Um, just a quick housekeeping. If you have questions, please hold them until the end of the presentation and place them in the question panel, and I will be reading those out for our presenter. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Derek Parks. Thank you, Katie. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is another installment of our NOAA Innovator Series Brown Bags. Uh, and uh, I'm with, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm with the Technology Partnerships Office here at NOAA. I am the uh, Technology Transfer Program Lead, but today we have um, a company who has benefited, uh, which has benefited from our Small Business Innovation Research Program, uh, both in NOAA and actually through other federal agencies, and that is Hydronalix. So today we have um, Anthony Mulligan, who's the CEO and President of Hydronalix. Uh, Anthony founded Hydronalix to develop advanced surface robots in 2009 after he had uh, sold a previously existing company to uh, BAE Systems. So Anthony's been active in developing and using robotic systems for earth science and disaster response, law enforcement, and defense missions since 2001. And he's managed over 120 million in funding for R&D acquisition and deployment in this field since 2000. So Anthony's gonna tell us uh, a little bit about their latest endeavors and uh, what Hydronalix is up to and how they've uh, been benefiting from uh, SBIR funding through the federal government. So I will turn it over to Anthony Mulligan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Anthony Mulligan. Um, the reason why I'm on this webinar is, as uh, stated earlier, in 2009, after uh, selling my UAV business, I had been working with our friends at NOAA, uh, previously with aircraft, and they had asked, since I can no longer build aircraft, could I build uh, small robotic boats, uh, initially for marine mammal studies, and to look and see if it was feasible to use in that application or for uh, 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 shore erosion or, or possibly calibrating antennas. The uh, NOAA didn't have a solicitation in that topic at the time, but shortly after the Navy did, and we had won a, uh, our first source of funding was a, was a initially a Navy SBIR, but very quickly um, the uh, NOAA SBIR office was able to help uh, our sponsors over at OAR to uh, go straight to a phase three with SBIR um, so that we could develop a more robust platform that could go into hurricanes um, and possibly collect data to see whether that was feasible. That um, effort had developed to the understanding that, hey, we can make a small boat handle extreme weather and extreme uh, waves and currents. And if it smashes on the rocks, it's OK. Um, and uh, that was the basis of what we now called Emily, uh, which is uh, basically a miniature version of the, uh, the hurricane boat. Um, with grab ropes and flotation for people to grab on when they're in distress. So over the years, this uh, project has evolved to, we've now shipped 400 systems. We're commissioned in, I think, 26 different countries, but we've done operations or missions in over 40 countries. And um, the platform is developed to systems that collect water samples to swift water rescue uh, along with the ocean rescue to police applications and now also for uh, sonar imaging so uh, what we call sonar emily and all in a platform that weighs under 40 pounds so you can check in on an airplane um, this isn't the ideal situation for doing high-end bathymetry mapping but this is a way to see big objects very quickly. It's a system that's easily learned by lifeguards or policemen or firemen. They, uh, you can throw it in the water and say, did a car drive into the river there or into the lake there? Um, and to look for big objects. With more skilled operators, you can also um, find smaller things. Um, 
and it's also set up for ideal water situations, but because of its robustness, you can drive it in white water in a river or in the surf zone of the ocean. Um, our work in the disaster world had led us to, to introductions with key NGOs, non-government organizations that respond to disaster relief. And um, the subject of today's topic is uh, the work we did in Abaco at Marsh Harbor um, immediately following Hurricane Dorian's passing. Dorian's passing. So the an NGO that we work with is um, their specialty is going in immediately upon the storm's passing to help with the, the first medical, to help with infrastructure setup, um, these things before the, the volume of first responders and disaster responders can come in. Our first slide shows um, one of the first things on arriving, um, the team put up a small quadcopter to just get a basic lay of the land. And mind you, this is um, uh, Wednesday, September 4th, early in the morning, um, shortly after the flooding had subsided from the airport. Um, right page down. Um, the next slide. So the team um, all met at Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we chartered a, they chartered a small plane um, and uh, they uh, flew over the Bahamas. The storm was still there, so they couldn't land. Um, so to be the first group in, I didn't see a picture here. Uh, it's a pretty small plane. And um, so here, the, this next slide, they're, uh, they're loading all these uh, orange containers that are filled with medicines and critical supplies for the very beginning. And they're, they're also teamed with some medical doctors and staff um, as they're gonna be the first ones in. Uh, next slide um, shows on the left with the arrow, that red bag is actually an Emily system, um, sonar system. It's about 52 inches long and about 18 inches wide and about 18 inches tall. Uh, the gentleman on the right is one of our staff members who's experiencing going and doing uh, mission operations in austere situations. The bottom line here is there's not a lot of room for uh, large pieces of equipment. The bigger our equipment, the less medical supplies, things like whether it's insulin or asthma medicine or um, antibiotics or, um, or water treatment, um, whatever it tends to, to have or the uh, medical gear that the doctors need. Um, so it's very important that the footprint be small. So the team arrived in Nassau and uh, finally on uh, Tuesday and the contribution of a uh, mega yacht called the Loon, uh, captain by Paul Clark. Um, the Loon was already being preloaded and had already arrived to uh, Nassau. And the team basically loaded up and uh, um, headed out. This is a picture of the Loon entering um, uh, into harbor, but the boat could not come in until after Emily had gone in and mapped the clear passage. Inside of the loom, which um, was technically really the second supply ship to arrive, um, all three decks of the ship were completely filled with supplies for the first team of medical doctors, nurses, and also the crew that was gonna become the initial uh, airport traffic controllers and also for the ship control for into the harbor. The, uh, in Nassau before, after they arrived in Nassau before getting to Abaco, um, a second boat, the IMS commander, was also loaded up with more gear um, of supplies and emergency equipment. And they finished the loading on Tuesday night, probably around 10 or 11 p.m. And then the, uh, they had to begin the, uh, 
12, 13 hour um, cruise from, from Nassau to uh, Abaco, to Marsh Harbor. So they arrived in uh, Marsh Harbor um, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I believe it was like um, 1400, so around two o'clock or uh, slightly after. And um, so the place is decimated. It's not just what sailboats and yachts and barges um, have been stripped away from the docks and into the harbor, but it's also things like uh, the buildings um, that aren't existing on the shore anymore, rooftops, cars, vehicles, um, all types of things that the storm blew into the harbor that could foul a ship's propeller or rudder system. Um, and uh, other things too, like uh, large tractor tires and um, things that you might use on piers to for ships, they, they end up in the storm in the water. So the water was an ideal for um, high clarity imaging. You can see here, it's a little bit choppy. Uh, the Emily platform that we went out with was our first available on the shelf, which is the Navy. A nav air asset. Um, it's in camo and color instead of red and yellow. Um, but we're looking for large objects. So they just needed to know, was there a boat down below it or, or a vehicle or, um, you know, things that you can't see from the surface. And so the motion of the water really didn't interfere with the data that they were needing to collect on this mission. Um, so Emily was technically the first to go in. Her draft is only about an inch and a half and there's nothing to catch. So even if you can drive over ropes or even if you hit the tip of a sailboat mast, um, there's nothing on the bottom. It's designed to slide over things, uh, over beaches or debris. Um, so they're able to look left and right with the side scan sonar and they can see large objects um, one or 200 meters to the left or right. And uh, so they, they could actually map out the, they could see where everything was and map out a passage. The, uh, after they mapped out um, the first passage, they had set up on the, uh, the dock at Marsh Harbor, um, that building what's left behind used to be where um, you would go through uh, your customs and you'd go that the port authority was operating there uh, to manage the ships that came in and out to the uh, to the pier side so as you can see it really was no longer functional so uh, um, the team was set up and operating there uh, when they were doing shore operations with the emily but the uh, the rest of the team there's only two people running emily out of a team of 28 the other 26 were doing the, uh, the the other disaster response activities. The ground station shown in orange has a Wi-Fi radio. So if you can see the boat, it'll communicate to the boat. It works on line of sight. Um, and the Hummingbird system is there. It records the data and you can see it real time. And then the, we process the data on SARHAWK software afterwards in order to generate uh, maps for the, for the ship controllers. Um, one of the things the, uh, that Emily, so after clearing the shipping lanes, the mission was still to continue clearing. So there's lots of things like these telephone poles, you know, are sitting out there. Uh, they show up very quickly on the side scan sonar. Um, some of them they move, the divers could connect ropes or a cord and then they could pull these items up on the shore. The uh, Another function was um, obstacles that they couldn't move, um, they would tag them. So you could see them at high tide or low tide. Um, and so they were visible um, for the, uh, the ship pilots when they're driving the vessels in. So there's there was a wide array of different obstacles. Um, the, uh, that they had to deal with in this case. Um, so here, here's a, a tree had been uh, transplanted a few hundred meters from the shore into the water. Um, 
it's small on top, but if a ship's propeller grabbed that, it could pull and foul the, the, the trees much larger on the bottom, it could foul the propeller or the rudders. Um, and so these items also were, were tagged and marked. Um, the, uh, the team went through quite a few number of, of uh, buoys and markers. So the first ship that um, was able to come in, which was shortly after Emily finished the mapping, um, within a couple hours, um, I was told, was the IMS commander. So that ship carried a lot of uh, supplies, critical medical supplies, water uh, making equipment, generators, um, things to help the doctors and uh, nursing staff that, or medical staff that came on. Um, and then the uh, the second ship was uh, um, the Bohemian Navy ship, the P-424. Um, so uh, both of those used the uh, the maps generated from the sonar imaging. The uh, Navy, once the Navy ship arrived, then there was an ability to uh, to put up security because now it's within a couple hours of these boats arriving, um, people started um, collecting because they're like, oh, um, help is finally coming. And um, so once there was some security, then they were able to bring um, the mega yacht loon in. And um, mind you, this is the, so the loon is basically the third ship to arrive um, when the hurricane had passed that night um, and the next day. And it was loaded all the way up. So they had the equipment for makeshift hospital um, and to get the hospital services running along with the medical staff. And then the team also had a place to uh, a dormitory to live in um, for 28 people um, off of the loon. And then once the loon was uh, unloaded, then it was able to pull away from shore. So, um, and then the, the Bohemian of officials provided some security. So they have to, they, they want to make sure people, they didn't get mobbed by people that were in a critical way, um, is my understanding. The uh, the maps, the sonar maps um, that Emily generated and then processed through the SARHAWK software were uh, put up on the walls inside of uh, the um, Incident Command Center. So the command staff um, could manage and control as more ships were coming in. So by the next day, there was becoming a steady flow of ships coming in. And uh, they were helped by the uh, uh, British Marines who had arrived, um, but didn't have a, a way to a map or clear the harbor, but they were there supporting the, the traffic flow. Um, and as they widened the shipping lanes, then um, you didn't have to wait for one to come in and one to go out. Um, another equal, you know, another part, part of the challenge was mapping and clearing around the, the K walls for, for the ships to dock to. So the uh, SARHAWK software allows you to uh, build a geo-reference map of the sonar imaging. And the uh, little tags on the left there are uh, items that the operator had decided were uh, potential hazards for a, for a vessel coming in to dock on the K wall. So um, they built extensive maps of all the potential areas for ships to come ashore um, along this section. This was on the east section here um, so they're, uh, um, then they would go and decide, okay, whether the, the ships go around these items or whether they would remove them. So the uh, team included a dive team and the dive team could go down and decide what to do about, about these, uh, obstacles, um, whether they were going to be too big to move initially or whether, uh, they, and so the, the vessels, when they come into dock, would uh, go around these obstacles or whether they uh, they could actually um, remove them. The uh, It was critical to do this as fast as possible to get as many ships. 
because very quickly, as you can see in this photo, hundreds of people started um, gathering and coming up and realizing that, hey, ships are coming in. There's a chance, you know, that they could be evacuated. Um, so um, being able to have more than one vessel on the uh, uh, pull up to the, to the dock wall was, was very important to happen. Um, the uh, one of the first larger ships to come in, um, the uh, was basically all of these ships were now using the maps and the guidance that the uh, incident command center had. Um, and as more larger ships came in, they were able to get the equipment so that they could get the airport running and uh, um, and get more power power restored or temporary power restored to uh, key facilities like the hospital. Um, and then when the ships were leaving, people were able to board the ships and to leave on the ships. Um, this particular ship here had an incident though where it had a uh, snagged a floating tractor tire and the, um, the team was able to, uh, to free that ta tractor tire um, and then it, it was able to resume its its path to uh, Nassau very quickly after. Um, after securing ma <coughs> mapping and passage for Marsh Harbor, the team went on to other locations. Uh, the next critical location was Baker's Bay, about um, 12 to 15 kilometers away. Uh, this is just a Google image before the hurricane and nobody had been able to get in and out yet. Um, they weren't sure, you know, how bad or difficult things were. It's it's a high-end uh, marina housing, but there's a lot of citizens and people that live in that area supporting the island. Um, so they, uh, the, the team jumped on a tender and uh, brought Emily. Um, here's Emily. The full pack out for Emily is just the gray boat you see, um, then the little orange case, and then a little black bag. And, um, and then, of course, this tender was loaded with other things um, for when they arrived there. They also, for uh, other closer places or areas that they were even less sure about, they would put the uh, Emily package on on a smaller boat like this little uh, rubber craft with a 30 horsepower motor. Um, so again, the small footprint was very useful. Um, so they could zip over to other locations that they didn't want to go into in the tender. Or if the tender was busy running supplies and they could map those areas and then uh, process and uh, and then give that to the incident command center. Um, so the uh, the boat it's, itself only weighs about 36 pounds, 37 pounds, and the ground station only weighs about uh, 13, 14 pounds, um, and the, it has enough battery to last for several hours of sonar mission, and then it only takes a few minutes to change the batteries. Uh, here's uh, the ground station up and running. Uh, you'll see sitting on top of the ground station under the towel is a uh, is a battery box. So if you don't have local power, you can use the same battery that runs the Emily. So everything's interchangeable. Uh, the operator can drive the boat manually by hand. Um, and they can also um, enter in waypoints and drive it autonomously. A lot of times they were just driving it by hand. Um, because you're building a, a mosaic map anyway, and they're just quickly wanting to get to uh, to see if they can chart out certain sections, and um, wasn't didn't really the, the the value of autonomy wasn't very high in in most cases out here because they're uh, trying to check specific places and they wanted to do it very quickly. Um, a lot of places they could come in in 10 and 15 minutes. Um, build a map and check everything and move on to the next spot. Um, this is Baker's Bay. Um, a lot of boats in the water here, a lot of uh, empty docks and piers because everything was blown away. 
Um, so um, this one, you don't need the sonar image. It's pretty obvious that it's right there. Um, and unfortunately, this was a case in a lot of these marinas. Um, so they did uh, map out to decide where should the supply vessels come out, come in. Um, and you can see they've tagged uh, items that they consider hazardous for incoming. So they're looking at can they bring boats on the uh, on in the left lane or the right lane. Um, and so now they um, their job wasn't to to clear those items, so to speak, but it was really to identify um, where those hazards were. Um, the left is a geo reference of where they surveyed. And on the right, you can see an example of um, debris that the uh, sonar um, was showing them. The uh, another advantage um, with the small system, they could drive under piers. Um, they they weren't so concerned about mapping under the pier, but it was a shortcut to get to the next location, um, and they could drive over sunken vessels or boats. Uh, because it it wouldn't catch on the Emily Hall, so um, and they could still image while they're driving under the pier, but it, it really uh, simplified. Uh, another nice feature was all these piers and docks are are wood, so the radio waves, the Wi-Fi goes through those pretty good. They don't they don't block the radio signal. Um, it's more of an issue when you have metal or cement or uh, um, piers and pilings. Um, most of the time, the team was running pretty much 20 hours a day. So in some locations, they had to just keep on mapping until they were done. So they would also be mapping at night and um, they'd be waiting for the tender to come back and pick them up at a certain time. And so their job was to get as much done as they possibly could um, under that pressure. Uh, the sonar system does have navigation lights, so um, that made it easier. And then many times, more so at night, they would tend to run it autonomously because you could put in the waypoints and you didn't have to worry about where you're driving. Although they could always see the boat when they were when they were mapping. Um, so, uh, and some items are a lot bigger than other items that. You're just not going to be able to move that one with with a small two or three person team um, to clear the way for the uh, the larger vessels coming in. So they you just come up with a different path where the ship will come. Um, the uh, operator there is carrying the boat on his shoulder, um, and this is the whole key to this success is the very small footprint that provides sonar imagery. Um, that's adequate and good enough to uh, to get the job done. But the real key is that um, no outside power, limited uh, um, availability, high of, uh, of resources, and high reliability is, is what was really required to succeed in this mission. And that's um, so the simplicity, um, so you can operate when you're really tired after 18 hours and the the Kevlar hull and the durable components. So when you crash into things and hurt things, it doesn't it doesn't bother the vehicle. Um, and whether it's uh, uh, gets pretty hot there in the, in the sun, but not as bad as in the desert. Um, so the uh, those were the key items. Um, and that that's why this particular asset was able to succeed in this particular mission. Uh, that concludes the talk. Um, and I think we're going to go away. So thank you, Tony. Um, this is Derek again. And um, so what we normally do at this point in the presentation is Katie has been um, keeping track of any questions that have come in and um, she can ask those to you directly. In the meantime, I uh, wanted to ask just to get things kicked off. Is this the first um, post hurricane use that you had for this? Forgive me if I missed that early in the presentation, but I wanted to check on that. 
Um, so we, we were involved in Hurricane Harvey uh, two years ago. And um, a few days before the hurricane, the, uh, the flooding was higher than was expected. And the incident command center in, uh, in Houston that was concerned about the Brazos River had asked us to come in and quickly map two key areas on the Brazos River um, so they could see the profile so they could then calculate what, what was happening with the, my, my understanding with the flow rate. And um, they were able to determine that flooding was gonna be very different than they originally anticipated. And that allowed them to change their decisions about where do they stay pre-stage uh, first responders and people for after the storm would flood, so or after the storm would pass. So uh, we were told that that was valuable for that planning. The actual missions only took a total of about 30 minutes each. Um, we went to the sites and uh, threw the boat in, made the maps real quick, came back and gave the data to uh, to the incident command center, and then um, they were able to do the rest. The, uh, we also, while this was going on for the Bahamas, um, we were uh, serendip or uh, fortuitously, the fire department in Norfolk had received their first sonar system and, and rescue boats, and we were training them that week. So um, our staff stayed and helped them in um, practicing their post-hurricane missions of, they were given the assignment for uh, uh, to check and make sure certain channels were going to be clear uh, right after the hurricane. And so the fire department was in the hot area. So they were able to uh, to go in right away after the uh, the hurricane had passed in Norfolk and, uh, and check the key areas that they were responsible for. So um, we didn't have staff at that time, but it was the systems that we had just trained them on that they used. Okay. And you kind of um, led me into my next question, which is to talk a little bit about your business model. Um, it sounds like, as you just said, you're looking to sell and sell systems to state and local federal authorities, and you would come in and train them up on how to best use the system. Are you, is that your primary focus business-wise, or are you looking to also do kind of Emily as a service uh, applications as well? Are you staffed up for that? Um, that is our primary business is to, uh, is to make boats and sell boats, um, and to, and to provide the training. Um, it's, uh, it's more complicated in international, uh, over half of our business is international sales. Uh, entities that have very tight budgets tend to be our customers. Um, we do, uh, we've, we employ a former fire chief who is a swift water rescue expert. And she also has a, a, a doctorate. And uh, the gentleman Vern is a former force recon and is very experienced in uh, expeditionary um, missions. So we'll support people um, for events like this that if it's, if it's core to what we do. So um, we didn't charge uh, to support for this mission, but we are provided with uh, travel and food and and being taken care of. Um, that happens a lot. Um, the, uh, in our, sometimes if a if an operation is really large, uh, we'll support it. Uh, for the last uh, year and a half or so, we we're told they've had uh, 20 boats stationed in Bali in Indonesia preparing for if the volcano erupted in case of the potential ensuing tsunamis afterwards. Um, we recently finished a program that DPSI funded and the Navy funded to this year to greatly revise our training program and build a, a certified training program which um, we received the help of the Los Angeles County Fire Department, uh, the New York City Fire Guys, the Austin Fire Guys, 
And so we have a far more extensive training program now with certification than we've had in prior years. Excellent, interesting, okay. Um, so Katie, or do we have uh, questions that have come in online? We do, we have a bunch. Um, so first off, I think this question may have been answered um, in the presentation, but could you expand on what the software uh, used to make the maps was? Uh, the software is called Sarhawk, and it's um, our supplier is Black Laser Training. So the, uh, the software's primary function is it's designed to take hummingbird data and data of other systems, but, and to generate it in a report format that's easy to use by law enforcement. Um, uh, it, it's heavy uses for things like when we're looking, doing a recovery operation of a drowned victim um, and to prevent, present things in a format that uh, the police captain or the fire chief um, or the lifeguard can uh, file in as formal reporting. Um, the software does have a uh, option for the survey um, version that um, does a better job of um, of doing the geo referencing of the data for map building, um, and so we uh, um, there's post processing that we're that was used to do that, but um, it was almost all the processing for immediately was done with the SARHAWK. Um, so it, it'll geo-reference the data um, and it, it it's a great way to catalog the hazards that you've marked and to look at other images of those hazards and so you can put them all in one place. So the, uh, the person who's making the decision can look at multiple views of the hazard. Great, thank you. To follow that up, um... Could you explain why you selected Hummingbird Helix as the solar platform for Emily? Um, that was, uh, when we made that decision, it, it was based on the fact that most of the search and rescue and fire department groups in the United States use the hummingbird sonar systems for uh, for looking for bodies that have drowned and really what we initially what we were trying to do was instead of them having to have a, a manned boat that they use with a trailer to in order to put their hummingbird sonar in um we chose to our, our idea was to put it in a small emily boat so they you can just stick it in the back of your truck or your car or your suv um, we looked at the Loran system, and um, but the the guys at Hummingbird seemed a lot more interested in helping us and providing us access to uh, the electronics um, so that we can incorporate our integration for the Wi-Fi and the remote operating. So um, it was really 50/50 on the on which system, but for the uh, performance wise, but then the, uh, the deciding thing was, it seemed a lot easier to work with the, uh, the Hummingbird guys than uh, the others. The, and then the other reason for Hummingbird is um, good quality imaging at a very low cost. So we have as a company use other much more uh, expensive and more capable software systems, but they were far more difficult to and complicated to be able to train a lifeguard or a fireman or a policeman. Um, you could get better imagery, but you had to have a, a more dedicated person. And in the first responder world, people can get trained really well, but then they don't use the system for six months. So simplicity is important. Okay, thank you. Um, last question on software, I believe. Is SARHAWK open source or is that protected IP? I believe it's protected IP. Um, anyone can buy it online, but if there's things that you want to do to it, uh, the guys over there are really easy to work with, and um, I would uh, suggest that um, one call them and talk to them and 
tell them what they want to do and they're um they're very reasonable and they're they're very open so i would imagine that they'll uh would get support okay thank you and now uh talking about this uh mission you described what um ngo was involved with um your work um so that ngo has asked us not to uh to go public with their name um it has something to do with if nobody if they don't get press or media attention then it's easy for them to go into many different countries and um, if one country doesn't like another country that they helped then they don't know that they helped them so that they don't have a problem so <laughs> that's great the, that's, that's, that's fine point. thank you so, um so I'll just move on to the next question. How were the locations of deployment decided, Amarj Harbor and Baker's Bay? Um, and did you also go to the go to Grand Bahama? Um, Marsh Harbor and Baker Bay, that was with the NGO and the Bohemian government. So the um, they had I, my understanding is they had coordinated that as a potential uh, as soon as it was determined that a that you know, Dorian might possibly hit the Bahamas, um, so that was that was pre-planned well in advance. And then, as the storm progressed, I think all their plans were just solidified. Um, the uh, Baker's Bay was chosen because um, they were. My understanding is they were concerned about how a low percentage of people that were able to evacuate before and it's close proximity to Marsh Harbor. Um, the team was only able to support one major setup, so um, that's why they, they didn't go uh, to other parts of the Grand Bahamas. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Um, given your own experience in post post disaster events, what was your perspective on the level of damage? Uh, it was extremely high. I I would say it's the worst that I've seen, or okay. that that we've been out to help. It was uh, comparable to the shorelines on the island of Lesbos when hundreds of thousands of refugees were coming across, but that was just really trash and a lot of drownings. This was uh, massive destruction. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the Emily Center. What type of uh, propulsion does the does Emily use? Um, it has a small, very high efficiency jet pump. The a lot of effort was made to re, to to make the efficiency as high as possible because we wanted to at all costs avoid propellers and rudders that could snag on things. Uh, the jet pump uses. Um, zirconia ceramic bearings, which are close in hardness to diamond. So when you're driving in sand or mud, mud like in the shore or in the river, the uh, the silica sand particles um, or the 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 mud particles are actually much softer than the ceramic, and they act as a lubricant. Versus with metal components, the bearings wear out very quickly, and salt corrodes them. The shaft is a uniaxial and then wound um, carbon fiber shaft that flexes so that we don't have to worry about shock and input from the motor moving relative to the pump, creating run out, which destroys bearings. And the pump material is a marine grade nylon that's reinforced by nanoplatelets of carbon. And uh, they look like your fingernail but they're only a few hundred microns in diameter and they are extremely abrasive, uh, much better than aluminum or steel uh, resistance. So, um, so they don't wear out when you're driving in the mud or sand um, at 14,000 RPM. And it allows, uh, you can eat rocks and tree branches and things and it doesn't, doesn't hurt the impeller um, the way the metal impellers. So we, we had problems earlier with metal impellers and metal stators 
literally exploding at 14,000 RPM when debris hits it. And with this composite, that's not a problem at all. Great, thank you. Um, is the side scan sonar of sufficient quality to do habitat mapping? Um, for example, seagrass mapping versus small sand channels or prop scars? I, I'm gonna throw an opinion out. I would say yes, but even more so on days when the water is calm um, to reduce the motion of the boat. Um, it definitely sees grass really well. Um, the um, And we notice in our test lake, we see all the fish houses and things very clearly. Um, the sonar is really set up for fishermen. So if, if you know what fish are in the area, um, it'll actually tell you. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it does have some pretty high resolution. Um, if the water conditions are right. So, and you have three frequencies, you, you go low, medium, and high. So if um, you can see a lot of definition sometimes with uh, in the high frequency for things that aren't far away. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, have you, or are you considering operations using multiple Emily boats working in tandem? Um, we are interested in that. We. We do have some customers that buy a bunch of boats and put um, autopilots. Sometimes they use ours, sometimes they use their own. Um, the, uh, the autopilot that we have in the boat to run off the Hummingbird system does lend itself to uh, um, receive waypoints from another way. So you could do collaborative behavior. Uh, we had an NSF program that we're working on having the boat operate with a uh, with a quadcopter so the quadcopter can be a relay and um, also help guide the boat um, when you're looking from the side profile you can't necessarily see all the people that might be in the water like you can from the air um, and we're we're always happy in, to work with people in that area great thank you um, talking more about Emily, uh, what type of batteries run the drive unit? We normally use lithium polymer batteries for first responder work. The battery size we use is the largest legal size that you can bring on a commercial aircraft. And four of those batteries are the most that one single individual can bring on to a commercial airplane. So that's, we've designed our our normal Emily battery module around those constraints because many of our customers will jump on a plane in a moment's notice to uh, to take their, their sonar boat to a location. Makes it very easy for, for international travel. Um, we do for some customers provide nickel cadmium batteries or nickel metal hydride batteries. Those batteries get hotter when they discharge, but they're safer in general when charging. And for some customers, we also provide larger, heavier um, sealed lead acid batteries, similar to what you'd put in your boat. Um, on, in the case of the sonar, a lot of customers tend to put more weight in the boat to make it more stable. So having a, a 15 pound sealed lead acid battery instead of a four pound lithium polymer battery doesn't bother them if they were gonna add 10 pounds of weight anyway. Great, thank you. I'm going to um, grab one more question. Um, how does the jet pump handle flotsam like uh, sargassum? So there's a grate on on the bottom that allows us to drive over ropes and things. So initially, operators that have low experience are going to have the problems when they uh, when they suck things into the pump. But then the operators, as they get experience driving, start recognizing that they've just about clogged on something. And if they let off the throttle right at that moment, the boat will coast and the momentum of the boat and the friction of the water will usually pull the, the seaweed or the grass um, from it. Um, but if you're not paying attention, what'll happen is uh, 
you can wind it up on a, like a wheel on the pump housing and eventually clog the pump and then you, the boat's going to limp back and you have to take a piece of wire and pull it all out. As operators get more skilled, they have that problem a lot less. Um, all right, thank you. I do have a question uh, for Derek, actually. Uh, is there a website where uh, our listeners can learn more information on participating in NOAA's uh, technology transfer office programs? Uh, yes, you can go to techpartnerships.noaa.gov and we have information on both the Small Business Innovation Research Program and the Technology Transfer Program. Um, and if anybody's interested, they can certainly contact me directly, derek.parks at noaa.gov. Great, thank you. Um, I have a few questions that I'm going to uh, save and share with uh, Anthony offline. And I think that is it. Uh, well, for my part, Tony, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to speak with us about this. I certainly do appreciate it. And uh, it's been very informative and I have a couple of follow-up questions I wanna ask you offline, but very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I hope it was of value to those who listened in some way or shape or form. So have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. This will be up on our YouTube channel shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Okay, bye.